All right, everybody. So we have Paul Jones, art director at CIG, here with us today to answer a few questions. Paul, thanks for uh, joining us to talk about your new book, Game Artist. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Um, so obviously, uh, we have Ender and Starlet here to help me go through a list of questions that we've came up for you. Um, specifically, though, I think Star Jump we started by doing creative content creation. So it wasn't just discussion videos, but we were, you know, started off by doing stuff that was a little bit more on the creative side. So because of that, we've, we've got a lot of uh, listeners and fans and people that are part of our community that are artists naturally. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone from, I know Ender's wife does art to, um, you know, just tons of people in our community are either 3d artists or illustrators or painters or, or what have you. So um, when I saw you were coming out with this book, I was immediately interested. I'm art director by trade as well in the film and television industries. And when I got the book and read it, and I think, uh, you know, Ender would agree with this, I I initially thought, hey, this would be a great book to kind of keep me up on best practices and maybe sort of what's going on in in the industry, you know, maybe other sides of the industry um, right now. But I think I was a bit surprised on how just um, in depth this book is on everything from industry best practices all the way to your health, your posture, your eyesight, to then some of the nitty gritty stuff like salary and bonuses. Um, I find it rare that you'll find books um, that that go into all those different facets of a career. Um, so, you know, a lot of the questions we have for you will obviously be on you, the book specifically, but they may be a little bit on, on maybe why you decide the book, write a book, mm-hmm. you know, with such depth and on such, you know, how, so many wide ranging issues. So, yep. um, let me just go so ahead and jump right into it. the question list here and, uh, let's ask the most basic, you know, basic of all questions. Um, what is an art director to you and what, what defines that role? <laughs> Oh, this is it's straight away. It's a tricky question. <laughs> it's almost a trick question. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends. Like, it depends on what type of company you work for, what kind of game they are, and how and the, and the structure of the company, right? So, um, but really, you know, the the sort of the art director is the person who is is setting the vision, and then you know, with the team working with the team, basically you're sort of passing that down and you're all working together, but ultimately the, you know, there can only be one head chef, right? In a kitchen, you can't have multiple head chefs. You've got to have that one key person that it's um, setting the direction, keeping things on track and, and really sort of, you know, you know, work, it's ultimately you're working with your team. It's not just the art director, right? So, you know, you'll have a concept team generally. You've got your trusted team of senior artists and um, uh, other, you know, other staff. So basically, you know, you're working, you're, you're all working together. So it's kind of a toolbox, essentially, you know, uh, I'm not calling people tools, but basically, <laughs> you know, you work everybody to the advantage of the project, basically. Everybody's got their strengths, right? So, right. and so even as an art director, um, and I found this out uh, relatively early on, I think in sort of Star Citizen days, you know, you just, just got to be prepared to li- take advice from or listen to basically, uh, you know, from a junior artist right the way up, basically, because everybody's got a, you know, everybody's got a perspective. And so you should never be so sort of, oh, I'm the art director, I know everything. You know, you basically want to be like, okay, that's a good idea. Hey, can I use that idea? I'm going to take it. I'll give you credit for it, but it's cool. It's going to advance the project. Yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so you're sort of that, you know, I guess ultimately you're the cheerleader as well. You want to be sort of providing a bit of energy and vision and sort of really sort of like banging the drum. You're like, okay, yeah. here's, here's how we go. So that's, it's not a short answer, but it's, yeah, it's no, it a, totally makes it's not sense. A clear cut, it's not a clear cut uh, role, is it? And also it can be um, like, because my role has become a lot more specialized since I started. So I'm now working with sort of like a, because like a hit squad of uh, concept artists and so we're very focused 
uh, and my role is very focused now, mm. whereas it used to be a lot wider. Um, but it's nice. It's a, you know, it's nice to be able to have that time. Like that's what I enjoy about it the most is I've got that time to dedicate to the team and really sort of get the concepts to where they need to be. Obviously, because they pay the bills for Star Citizen for uh, for quite a bit of the project, so it's important that um, we put in put in as much focus as we can. And it's just not, yeah, I just like being able to do the best I can without having to sort of feel like I'm spinning plates and some of them are dropping. You know, uh, at the moment, it, yeah, it's a good it's a good position. Great. Uh, real quick, uh, Ender, before we move on to your uh, next question, I did just want to hold up the book here, everyone. We are talking about um, Paul Jones' new book, Game Artist. Um, he's got a copy there, too. Um, obviously, this is a book uh, you should have if you're an aspiring creative. There you go. Um, if you're an aspiring creative or have any interest, not just um, as being, you know, for being a creative in the game industry, but I really think it applies to a lot of industries. Um, I know I've learned a lot, and, and I work in film and television uh, by reading a lot of this. So this is the book we're talking about. Go check it out if you haven't already. Um, yeah, so Ender. So obviously you say at one point that uh you wish you would have had this book uh on your shelf beside your two favorite books what made you initially write this book structured around career guidance uh that's a good question i think it had been i think it had been sort of simmering in the back of my mind for for years but ultimately it's you know, after so, what am I now? I think I'm 27 years in the industry. You sort of, you know, there was a just this continuing cycle of people joining, joining the industry and sort of having to make their way. You know, a lot of it is sort of um, not dark magic. You know, a lot of information is held within the company. And it's almost like familial. It's just passed down through the generations. New generation comes in, someone p- slowly piecemeals information they make mistakes so like oh yeah i shouldn't have done that didn't you know that oh, i should have done this it's that sort of stuff and then you know as you climb the ladder it gets harder and harder right the risks the risks get bigger the falls kind of get more treacherous possibly and especially when you enter into a management role it, you know the amount of times i heard someone sort of you know when they became say a lead artist or something they're like I had no idea you were doing this or when they get to be an art director like really you were dealing with all this and so i kind of just wanted you know i you know i started from the bottom and just worked my way up you know made a lot of mistakes obviously had a lot of successes too um but it's tough right and i was just like why why are we all having to march to this drum of everybody has to start at the bottom, everyone has to make the same mistakes, this weird repetition that's going on. And so, and it was that simple, really. It was like, right, I've got loads of ideas. I've, I've, I've done all the roles except principal, but obviously I've worked with principals um, and just felt like I wanted, it's almost like a, like a strategy guide for a game. It's like, okay, Here's how you start. Yeah. And, and yeah, of course, it's the world according to Paul. You know, other art directors will operate differently, but there's a, there's a lot of commonality in there. So from, you know, because that was my biggest worry, right, when I released it. It was just like, ah, oh, what if? Mm-hmm. What if everyone's like, Paul, it's not like this. I don't know what right. you think. <laughs> you know, that was the biggest fear. But um, it, it hasn't been that way, you know, so I've, you know, I've even had it other art directors say, oh yeah, this is, this is good. This, yeah. you know, this makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I've shared the book with, with several um, directors and I work at a company that has multiple uh, directorial staff and um, I've shared the book with them and a lot of them are, you know, live action based. One of them comes from the print world and there's a lot of crossover. They've all been really enjoying it. So. Oh, cool. Good. Yeah. Good. Before I get on to uh, a more difficult question, I'm going to I'm going to skip down to a little bit easier one. Uh, can you explain your writing process a bit? Uh, and and did you write this on your own or did you seek help for any of this? Yeah, well, yes and yes. So it's <laughs> like so at the start, it's um, you're sort of on your own, basically. And I very, so my wife is a writer, but she writes um, fiction, 
Um, mm. And so obviously this was a nonfiction book, but she had, she had already sort of got a lot of useful information to pass my way. So, but it's a very lonely journey, you know, you just sort of, but I kind of treated it similar to a game pipeline. So I had first pass, second pass, and then hopefully polish, but it was kind of, you're entering into the unknown territory then. So, um, but I'm quite process driven. You know, I like a good pipeline. If I can turn something into a formula, I'm like, great, I could just follow this. Boom, 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 boom. And, the, and I was driving my wife mad. But <laughs> so I, um, I initially started off in using Word. And then I moved to a, a program called Scrivener because um, it's a lot easier. You can you can visually see your sort of the structure of your pages. Mm. You can easily move them around because I kind of wanted to see. I always wanted to sort of see how much I was creating, where where it was fitting, and just editability. Words just not that editable. I don't know if you're the same as me, but as an art director in my field, I'm a very visual person. I tell this to Ender and Starlet all the time. I'm very yep. visual. It doesn't matter if I'm writing something or what I'm doing. There's always a visual component, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean to it. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I've got, um, I mean, we use it at work, which is where I found it. There's a, a piece of software called Miro, which is a digital whiteboard. Um and so I just I started using that as well for the for this. So basically, I've got the last four years of thinking all on a mirror board, like on, mm. on this whiteboard, and it's it's everything. It's the research, it's um, uh, interviewees, it's the graphics, it's, you know, and all the failures and all. You know, you know, I did like twenty. I think I did twenty five, maybe more variations of the cover. Um, it's just you know, it's ridiculous, but. And then eventually you get to a point where I'd, I'd written the book and it was half about me, about my journey, and then half about sort of what your journey was going to be. And then I realized, well, people aren't that interested in my journey, you know, to take up half a book. Mm. So I kind of dumped it all and start and took that bottom half and then restructured it and then just fed in little bits of me. And, and then I, it, what was important after that was setting deadlines. And so I started using a bit of software called, well, hold on, what was it called? Pace, Pacemaker, I think it's mm -hmm. called. And that was really great. And so I would sort of say, right, I want to do, I don't know, let's say lead artist is on average 20,000 words. I want that done in two months and then extrapolate. Hmm. timeline and then I would tell it which nights I was working and then which weekend day and then it gives you this graph and then you put in the amount of words that you do each you know each occasion you're writing and you get you know you get like a um, confetti and stuff when you hit your target it's and like so project management pivotal. for writing it's yeah, kind of cool yeah it was totally so I kind of uh, I basically developed my own pipeline and so I was very much on my own at that point in answer to first part of your question, Ender. And then I was always adamant that I was going to self-publish, um, but I wanted it to be a professional job. I didn't want it to be just uh, just to pump something out and it'd be low quality. Um, so then I went through a company called Readsy, and then you basically you find an editor. So I had someone to do sort of to help with um, – developmental editing and then we went on to sort of um essentially the polish and then i had then i had a beta reader team so i used uh, another bit of software to set up a beta reader team and it would send the book out to them collate all the feedback into one place implement the feedback another round of editing then it went to proofreader and then after proofreader, then, then you sort of split. So then you go to your book guy or your book woman, depending on who you, you know, whoever you're using. And they did the layout, uh, which took a lot longer than I expected just mm. because of the complexity of the book. And then to my indexer. And then that was it. Cool. So, yeah. Four years, <laughs> four years of hard work. Wow. What a process. Wow. Yes. 
Yes. And and you said something in there that actually shed some light on why Grimm is the way he is. I've known him 20 years uh, and it mm-hmm. took an interview with you to shed light because you said that you wanted it to be uh, good quality. And that's something that Grimm is always uh, uh, speaking about. So it's, it's the art director in both of you guys. And that makes a lot more yeah, sense now. For sure. Yeah. So you spoke a little bit on it, but can you give us a brief history uh, of your career as a designer? <laughs> As a designer, ooh, no, well, no days as a designer, uh, 27 years as an artist, but... Um, Creative would have been a better, yeah. a better no, word. A lot, of people, a lot of people sort of use it interchangeable, I'm just being pedantic. Um, so I started, I did a, essentially an industrial design degree equivalent. It, it was... Um, uh, like oh, many, many, many moons ago, I didn't, I didn't actually put enough sort of focus and effort into my degree, so I kind of sort of squeezed through. Um, I was kind of too busy enjoying life. I think I'm not really sure what happened, but anyway, I squeaked through. Had a, had it wasn't part of our course to do 3D, but they had a lab there, and. Um, I got a bit of computer time, but it was, you know, you were just, you, it was just numbers, you know, you were just dealing with numbers and essentially generating geometry. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like real time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but, you know, I played kids lo- um, games as a kid loads and it was just the classic. I sort of um, got to a point where I was like, right, I want to make, I want to work in video games. Like I didn't have any contacts at all. I managed to get an interview with somebody off the basis of my art, strength of my art. I'm not sure it was that great, but um, I got an interview, didn't get the job, but the poor guy, I just grilled him to death. I was like, what software do you use? What hardware? How much memory? What size monitor? Like, because I was utterly clueless. Um, and and I went to buy my own stuff, you know, I was, I was going to spend like three and a half grand or something because I was going to get a copy of 3DS Max. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was 3DS Max. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even 3DS Max, was it? It was 3D Studio, DOS mm-hmm. 2 and a yep. half. And um, anyway, through a random series of events, I basically got this gig where I got access to computers, hardware, software, and did jobs for them for free, basically. So I got to teach myself, got access to all this stuff. And you only had the one 3DS manual. That's that's all there was. And you just had to make your way through the tutorials. Mm-hmm. You know, it was almost pre-internet. There was a bit of internet, but that was it. And then um, I did that for two years and sort of we did all sorts of things, you know, heads and tails and, you know, animations and uh, architectural visualizations for some quite big companies as well. I don't know how we managed it because we were sort of really like a bunch of, I don't know what you'd call this, yahoos just pretending to know 3D. But I'd learned a lot and then I, um, and then, just quickly, I'll wrap this up. I, you know, I went to take a job uh, to work for a company in Japan. It didn't, that didn't happen, but we did the game and then that sort of just sparked it all off. And then I kind of went on to Star Lancer, which was working with Chris and Erin way back in the day. And then slowly I've worked my way up the ladder and then uh, had seven years in the States working for Epic. Oh, wow. And were you in North came. Carolina for Epic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, to- cool. Totally. We moved lock, stock, and barrel. So my wife and wow. my kids, basically, we, we sold our house here, sold everything, and just went, okay, let's go to North That's Carolina. That's a big move. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, were, we were possibly in North Carolina at the same time. Yeah. That's really? Well. Yeah, Andrew yeah. was in there for a long time. Where I'm from. Yep. Uh, which which area are you from? Uh, so I was raised in Oak Ridge, Greensboro area, and then I actually lived in Mooresville, Charlotte area oh, okay. uh, for a while. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get to travel as much as I liked. We, I seemed to do a lot of work when I was there. Yeah. yeah that's my only regret. Yeah. We had some friends, and didn't we enter in North Carolina that worked at uh, Red Storm? Uh, game developer yep. like for Rainbow Six yep. and stuff. We we had some. Yep. We were big in that community for a while. And we had some uh, developer friends that worked there. Uh, that was years ago. Wow, that's ancient. I can't believe I even remembered it's been that. A long time. <laughs> been a long time. Yeah, we occasionally used to meet up with um, some of those, some of that team, just for drinks and stuff. Yeah. 
there was always a bit of friendly rivalry because obviously, yeah. you know, it was a pick. You know, you always, yeah, I, for some reason, you always felt like you were a little bit better. Not that you were, it was just. Yeah. I um, I have a lot of friends. I actually started in the games industry uh, in college. I, I, I quickly got out of it for no other reason than just, you know, I'm young and my interests were shifting, but I uh, still have a lot of friends that work in the game, uh, the game industry, quite a few friends at Rockstar, several friends at Bethesda. So you know, kind of scattered around, but it, it's, it's always been something I've always had sort of one ear in, you know what I mean? And, and love to sort of be a fly on the wall on, on those processes. So um, Starlet, do you want to grab the next one? Sure. Um, so, Paul, is there a difference between creating concept art in the game industry uh, versus any other industry? And do you think um, there are unique challenges relating to art direction itself? Ooh. Well, I mean, I couldn't... I can try and answer this the best I can. Obviously, I've not worked in... I mean, I did a little bit of work for uh, VFX House way back in the day, but that was like a lighting technical director, so I'm not, not art directed, but I mean, I think, um, from what I've, you know, from all I can say is from what I've seen and more specifically, um, star citizen, if I use that as a reference, I mean, Chris has always liked heavy 3d for his concept. Like Chris, Chris really wants to see a, like a, almost a final vision. So we definitely take things way, way further than you would normally do for what I would call a traditional games, like say a traditional games company. Um, I, you know, like when I worked on Batman, Arkham City, you know, you might get, you know, I think I did, because I'd worked on the sewers and the sort of Wonder Tower and the underground train station. And I think I had one, had one image to work from and that was it. It's mm-hmm. like, kind of like this, it's kind of these colors, it's this kind of mood. And then it was like, right, build a level from that, basically. Right. And, and off you would go. Whereas um, Star Citizen and the ships and the, you know, the sort of weapons, they've sort of, they've gone to sort of like the next level of clarity. I mean, we kind of, I mean, the weapons definitely are almost a blueprint, like um, those we've got down pat um, and concept artists I work with. I mean, he's, he's awesome at it so he like the quality of his models is ridiculously clean like mm-hmm. they almost came ready they're mm-hmm. not but they, they have that sort of vibe and then sort of the ship stuff kind of varies depending on the artist you have some are super tidy some are a little more crashy a little more a little more loose so um but i guess it comes down to sort of luxuries of time and budget doesn't it you know so often yeah movies of under huge time constraints and it's okay let's just go 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 and you from what i've seen you know it's more people involved um probably less hands-on by the director as in they're probably not actually drawing on it and altering it it's like they'll bring in like 10 or 20 different artists and they'll pick what which bits they like and then it will move on to is it the production artist is it the production art director Mm -hmm. The kind of, they have similar titles, but the different roles, and then they will sort of take the concept art and sort of figure out all the missing bits. Um, so, yeah. So, cool. I mean, uh, definitely Star Citizen is not what I'd call you, what I'd call traditional. Yeah. You definitely leave a lot more to the imagination, I would say. Um, but I still think, um, you know, even though we spend, what, two, you know, it's between, t- like, Two months for a small ship, maybe, I mean, I think we spent seven months on the Banu uh, Merchantman. Which is gorgeous, by the way. Yeah. It's amazing looking. Amazing looking. Just as like concept art, it's amazing. Poster ready. We'll just call it poster ready at this stage. We've (laughs) we've just been working on the weapons um, for that, you know, like the big S8s and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. So. So yeah, we made some good advancements there. So I'm, I'm kind of keen to see how those materials translate. And I think we have a later question that we'll get to at that point that, that where we ask you specifically about, you know, why maybe one concept seems more fleshed out than another. We'll definitely get there. Um, 
Shifting back to the book real quick, though, um, and I sort of brought this up in our in our pre conversation before we started recording this. Um, I'm going to read my question. So, one aspect of the game artist book that I thought was really great was the fact that you touch on specific questions that typically sort of worry young artists. Uh, you know, they, they're kind of scared to ask these questions, and either, these are questions like salary, bonuses, uh, relocation, uh, things that would specifically affect an artist, or especially a young person's lifestyle, you know what I mean? Yeah. And But it's also one of the most important things in sort of an unspoken way. So, was the reason that you included, the, you know, these aspects in the book, was that something that you did on purpose? And can you expand a bit on on why you thought it was important to address those questions uh, in the book? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was 100% um, deliberate. And it's structured that, you know, initially all that sort of all that sort of content was in like a about what I called a bonus level. And it was right at the back of the book. And then just thought, actually, this is what a junior needs to know, or you know, even before someone gets into into the um, into the industry. And I think you know, there's always that temptation for the artist. You know, they stampede towards the software. You know, it's just you know, I've got to learn this, got to learn that, got to do this, got to do that. Must you know, post on the internet must must be better. But that's only half. You know, that's half of the job, you can let, you know. And so I just really wanted to make it obvious. You know, it's kind of, I did kind of want it to be a holistic guide. You know, it sounds a bit hippy-dippy, but I kind of wanted, you know, I guess, you know, like many people, you know, on the internet and on Twitter and stuff, and you see a lot of companies making mistakes and, and you see it over and over again. And it's just like, okay, and it's that first step thing. Everyone seems to be starting on the first step again. You set up a new company, they're on the first step. They make all these mistakes, whatever. And I just wanted to empower the artist with more information to know, okay, this is what you need to worry, not worry about. This is what you need to know. Here's some worrisome things, but also here's some techniques to sort of um, get you over the hurdle. And kind of, you know, it's kind of like, Maybe it's a bit handholdy, but just like, just don't forget this stuff. Don't, you know, a lot of this stuff can just, people will just push it to the side and just be like, ah, oh, no, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to work 18 hours a day. Or I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, have just be sat here too close to my monitor or, you know, and have, you know, it will be all hunched up and then wonder why my body is really yeah. not happy. And just sort of, you know, just give a hint to like, okay, just even if they ignore it, Maybe it just sort of sets the seed and it just sort of just sort of stays there until eventually they're like, ah, oh yeah, I remember that. It was in the book. He was talking about that. You know, I should have listened to that, but I'm gonna, you know, I'll look it up again. Yeah, it's it's so funny because those types of questions, if I'm in my you know, in my industry as an art director, I've had I've had meetings, you know, official meetings where you go into an office and you know, at the studio and you talk with one of the artists and they'll never ask you that stuff. But then, you know, I'll have them go, Hey, would you be free for lunch one day? And you go out to that lunch meeting with them and they're like, Okay, how much should I be charging, you know, for my day rate if they're a contractor or something like that? And it's mm-hmm. it's almost sort of like when you get outside of those studio walls, I find that you get those very blunt questions that they've been wanting to ask, but we're scared to ask. So yeah, that's something that stuck out to me. And, and, uh, you know, something that I think is really important uh, that this book addresses head on. And I think for young artists, especially someone that hasn't been through those negotiations or put themselves first in any sort of negotiations, um, I think that'll be very beneficial. So yeah, and I think it's, I mean, it's like anything, unfortunately, you know, negotiation is a skill and some people, some people do seem natural at it and some yeah. people struggle at it. And I definitely was, uh, I probably had a, I don't know, I had a foot in each camp probably in, and definitely sort of in those early days, I was, uh, yeah, just a complete newbie, just like, yeah, whatever, man, I'll just, yeah, <laughs> just whatever money you suggest, I'll take it. Um, and I got, you know, I got lucky generally. And then when I went to Epic, I remember they, well, Epic was setting up their sort of mini studio called Scion to do um, Unreal Championship 2, and that was a brand new team that they were pulling together. And that's ultimately why I went over. But I remember they asked if I'd be interested, or would I do an art test? 
<clears throat> and I think that was the first time where I really sort of was like, I can't, it didn't kick back. I was just like, well, I said, I said, honestly, I'd rather not. I said, I feel like my portfolio is strong enough and it speaks mm -hmm. for what you guys are looking for without having to do an art test. Yeah. And I worded it well for once and I didn't blunder into it. And I sort of, and I kind of then went back and I said, but you know, if, you know, if it's a deal breaker and you need me to do it, then, you know, I guess I can do that kind of thing. <laughs> it was kind of an informal situation. Yeah. Um, and so I got away with it. I didn't, I didn't have to do an art test. I mean, I was a senior artist, but um, I generally feel that senior artists don't need to do an art test. Yeah, they, they, I they totally agree. Hours. Yeah. But um, yeah, it can, be, it can be hard for sure. That's strange, actually. I'm just thinking now, my entire career, I don't think I've had to do a programming test yeah. being a senior <laughs> software developer. That's the weirdest thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> What do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions about working in the creative side of the games industry? Ooh, one of the biggest misconceptions. I, do you know what? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that one. I mean, I suspect that uh, probably that you, you know, I suspect that people feel like they need to work as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Um, to climb the ladder. I suspect there's a big pressure there um, yeah. from kind of like bits and bobs that I've seen on Twitter. Um, I almost wonder if, if it's CIG, Paul, with, with CIG growing, you know, we've heard multiple times now in, in multiple videos, you know, the studios expanding and stuff. I almost wonder if like, if one of those misconceptions, because I think my, I had this misconception was that how many people touch something, you know what I mean? Especially, you know, with you on the concept team, you know, you may, you know, sort of gestate that seed of an idea through concepting, but then, you know, all the hands that have to touch it mm -hmm. for that to become a reality. I, I have a feeling that would surprise most backers. Yeah, and I, I, I actually, it'll probably surprise, you know, sort of people entering into the industry too, you know, juniors, you know, they're sort of like, I thought I just made an art, mm -hmm. and it just went away and, you know, there was no repercussions, but, you know, it's, you know, it's got to be to metric, it's got to meet all these requirements. I mean, it's half, you know, I think, you know, making art is a wonderful thing, but making game art, well, actually any digital art, maybe any art, you know, it's just as much technical, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's how, it's how to use the tools. And then the double, you know, the double whammy is when you hit the problem, how do you get a, you know, how do you fix the problem? I mean, it's pretty much, you can almost boil down art to problem solving from start to finish. You, you know, you start with a blank canvas, you've, you're trying to create something. How do I create it? What you know, sizes, dimensions, values, uh, you know, all sorts of things. It's just this constant um, decision making process. Yeah. Of course, there's some fun in there and there's some creativity, but in video games, it's you know, it's it's, it's really quite technical. Um, and so, some people, some people are just like, mm, I just want to make cool stuff. <laughs> I want to like. I don't want to have to worry about collision or proxy meshes or uh, UVs or yeah. uh, you know any of that sort of stuff. So, cool. it, I mean, it's you know it's a big, you know it's it's basically a big subject to learn, isn't it? It's yeah. there is you can't just. It would be nice to like push the fast forward button and sort of like be like three years ahead and be like, ah, oh, okay, I know stuff now, <laughs> you know, Matrix style or something. Um, but you've just you know you've just got to do it and you've got to log the hours. But it doesn't mean you have to work yourself to death. Yeah. So, how do you think the game industry ranks uh, in terms of compensation versus other fields? Is it an industry where you can advance pretty quickly, provided you have the skills? It seems to be. I mean, it's. I mean, I feel like people are advancing faster than than the. I mean, than I used to, or um, sort of, you know, ten, even ten years ago. I think maybe people are. I think it's like everything. They, they, you know, I've just been watching the Olympics, the Winter Olympics. You know, that every year that bar just gets pushed slightly higher, and then all the new people, their expectations. You know, they they have to meet that bar, and so it, it's constantly going higher and higher. So people, people skills are advancing faster. 
Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of compensation, I don't know. I think it's very much. I think it's. I don't know about compar- comparatively to other industries. Um, I mean, at least when you make games, you've got a chance of getting a bonus. You know, if it's a, if you know if you happen to get on one of those companies with a successful project and you've done your time there and you get a good bonus, great. Do you know what I mean? That's, you know, that's nice. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, there's lots of stories about that, but you know, there's probably like for every one of those stories, there's probably another 50 where people are just making their regular salary Mm -hmm. and and that's it. I mean, I've got, I've got friends at um, uh, what's called frame store in London that's more my uh, wife worked for a long time. Really? That's where yeah, I worked she, for. Okay. Yeah. For my, my wife was uh, um, a senior at the New York frame store and um, they actually offered her the head of, the head of production role, um, but we ended up moving from New York. So um, she didn't take it, but uh, we still stay in contact with a lot of the frame store people, really smart people there. <laughs> tell you that mm-hmm. much. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, I was working on Dinotopia, and uh, cool. yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, it was it was quite eye opening. Just the sort of uh, how clever the people were, basically. Yeah, yeah, she worked on Gravity a little bit and uh, a couple other things, but really talented people there. So that's all, mm-hmm. all I remember. <laughs> but in terms of compensation, like I mean, obviously there's your salary, and they're probably I suspect on a higher salary. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's no project bonuses, but I could be wrong. So yeah. I, don't, I don't want to spread misinformation. <laughs> um, truck and ride along, because we have just some, obviously, these are general questions we've been asking you, some about the book, some about your career, some about just creative roles in the industry and stuff. Um One thing I wanted to ask you, just because I deal with this a lot, especially I find young artists uh, coming in the industry, artists especially that are part of my team have a trouble have trouble grasping this sometimes. But you know, as a veteran creative, you know whether that's an art director or even a creative director or whatever the title may be. You have to deal with criticism on your work as well. Maybe that's from, in my field, it's typically from the end client. Uh, In in your field, I'm sure you deal with it from people that are up the ladder all the way to to Chris Roberts himself. But how do you handle critique on your own work and what advice could you give uh, a young creative in terms of handling criticism or or approaching criticism? Because, you know, for a lot of young artists, that first time they get that bit of criticism on something they think is really good or they're really particularly proud of, it can be a little bit of a gut punch. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally understand this because I was, I was the worst at accepting um, (laughs) critiques, let's say, because there's a difference, right? There's critique and there's criticism. That's true. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I think it's, like, like it, my experience in the VFX industry was that uh, they didn't give a monkey's about your feelings. And it was just like, <laughs> get this done. That's my life, Paul. That's my life. Yeah. And so <laughs> that was one of the reasons I shifted out because I was a bit too delicate and sensitive for that kind of lifestyle. Yeah. And, and I don't think my ego could take it. When I say ego, I mean just like, you know, the sort of the, the creative ego. And, um, and I, you know, it was a real shock uh, working on Star Citizen because Chris was very much a movie director and very much in a movie director mode, and he was used to working in that style where it just there was no, there was no polish, there was no like holding back. It was like there was a couple of emails where I was, you know, I, you know, I was like, oh, I might just go home and just go under the duvet and, and just hide for the rest of the day. Oh. I was just like. <laughs> And so, you know, that's only, what, eight years ago? Um, and so I've kind of had to figure it out. And I think it's, um, you know, if you're ever, you know, if you're, a, if you're a sensitive soul like I was, well, I still am, you kind of have to understand that, um, what, like what I've had to do is, you, you know, so, and because most of my feedback is direct from Chris, so mm-hmm. there will be other people involved, but the main one is Chris. And so it's really just sort of removing yourself a little bit from the process and understanding that if, you know, if you're only providing one option, <clears throat> excuse me, you probably, you know, you're probably going to get some changes, like better to hit provide three options. And it also is, 
flexing of your your own mental muscle, right? So it's like you go from a one horse race to a three horse race. You know, you're less. You're sort of splitting. You know, you no longer have your favorite. They all could be good, right? And so they're like, well, I like a bit of this. I really don't like that one. Change this. And you're like, okay. But it does. It, it like I don't think it comes like naturally. Like I think it's you know you you have to sort of build up to it. But it's also as well, it can be made easier on on the person receiving the feedback. So you know when you're at senior level, there's that expectation of well you're a senior, so you need to be able to deal with it, and that's just it. Mm-hmm. But you know when you're dealing with juniors and people sort of you know even. Mid career, oh, and and to be honest, I don't think I think there's there's no reason that this can't be adopted from top to bottom, and that would be my ideal. To be honest, is so that you can people can do stuff, and you can say you don't like it, and it's not what you're after. But if you qualify it, and you say, well, I'm after, you know, and you don't come out with the classic, it needs to be more cool, mm-hmm. which is well, and I have no idea what that is. You know that's impossible. Like, how do I work with that? Yeah. But you're like, well, you know, it's something about you know, say what it is, proportions or complexity or the wrong style, and you give them something to properly latch onto. Then they're like, oh, okay, right, yeah, I know what my art director wants. Yeah. No, no problem. And so, you know, when I have that sort of feedback, I'm like, yeah, right, yep, yeah, I know that wasn't right. We march in this direction, off we go, and and we've done it countless times with countless ships, and there's countless videos of me saying, "Well, we've had difficult births, yeah, for, for ships where it's just gone wrong, and yeah. where you know I've turned up to a meeting and thought we were going to knock it out of the park, and Chris has gone, oh, I hate that, All right? Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's always a good and, start to uh, to a work week. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. And so, um, and so it's just been sort of dealing with, it's, what did I watch the other day? There was, it made a great comment about failure. What was it? Uh, practice is controlled failure, mm. basically. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, you know, failure is something I've really disliked in my life. Like I was, you know, I try to avoid it. And so, yeah, we'll do lots of practice for some stuff, but and when failures happen, I really, really dislike it. Um, and that is part of, you know, my new, you know, recent pull, I would say, you know, of trying to sort of make that shift to be just a little more flexible and understand that things are going to go wrong. And, yep. and it's more about how you, your versatility, like I've, I've, I've come to understand that I'm really quite good at pivoting now, now so I can I'm like, okay, if Chris goes, I hate all 20 of those sketches, I can go, we can go right back to the drawing board. I can yeah. pull new reference. So, right, we're, we're doing this now and not not lie awake at night sweating about it or yeah. waking it the classic used to be waking up at three in the morning <laughs> like a hot sweat yeah. worrying about stuff um, yeah. and so i think it's some of it is experience but some of it is how the information is delivered cool so for any of our viewers out there that are sitting here contemplating going into the game industry as an artist what is the uh, single most important piece of advice you feel you can give them? Uh, maybe it's buying your book. Uh, or well, obviously, that would be number one. Yeah. <laughs> it's number one. Buy the book. Then, um, I mean, if you know, if you go into the game industry, I mean, it's it's understanding that everybody's going at a different pace, right? So I, I think there's a lot of pressure um, because. You know, you go on art station. I mean, I go on art station. I look at it and I'm just like, oh God, my work sucks. And like, uh, you know, you look at other people and you're like, oh, I wish I could do that. And so there's this real weird pressure of, if you're not careful of just feeling like, I might as well just, you know, I might as well just give up now. Like, it's not going to happen. But then you've got to get over that, right? And you've got to, and that's that. 
you've got to be able to sort of be able to take the risks. So whatever that risk is, you know, learn some new software that you're like completely shit scared of. You're just like, oh, I don't like the interface. But it's, you know, for me, it's breaking it down into its component problems. What don't I like about the interface? Oh, I can't find this button. Mm. Where is that button? Find that button. Okay, that's gone. Right now, you know. I mean, it's ridiculous. Some of the granularity that I have to go down to to solve some of my problems, just for me to get over the hurdle. But it kind of works. But you know, there's that, and I think it's just you know, there's trying to just treat it again. It's you know, every, if you want to be an artist, you obviously got you've got to be interested, and it's all about the portfolio if you want to get a job. Yeah. You know, no portfolio, no job. After your portfolio, then it's your personality, and then and then you're in, right? Um, it's but you've got to understand that uh, in that learning process, yeah, you are going to make lots of mistakes, and you know, I think we all have it. We have that that little gremlin in our head that's giving you the bad news or, you know, trying to bring you down about something. And, you know, it's treating yourself as you would your best friend. That's my, that's one of my favorite things is where you sort of like, okay, what, what if, what would I say to my best mate? Like, you'd be like, don't worry, you know, you're doing fine. Like you're having a, you're learning, it's new. You sort of reframe it, you put it in context. And then you're like, okay, just move, you know, just move on. It's it's not yeah. simple, but you're doing it, and that's and that's what counts. And you just gotta, you just gotta do the hours as well. Yeah. There's no there's no shortcut. There's you've got to put in the work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just can't leapfrog. Yeah, and that's that's the difficult thing. Yeah, I I feel like I need a new best friend. Grim typically beats me and puts me in the closet. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we 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 went through a bunch of questions, obviously related to uh, the the creative industry, especially the in in regards to the game industry specifically. Um, talked a little bit about the book. Again, everyone should go pick up Game Artist if you haven't already. We're going to be giving away a copy of that um, on the end of the episode here. Uh, but we did have a few. Um, questions that are are more cig focused in your in your day to day there obviously uh feel free to pass on any of these you don't want to answer none of them are too specific yep. on specific ships or specific anything really they're more general questions about the process uh, but Ender, did you want to go ahead and lead off with those uh yeah what's the most enjoyable aspect uh, of your job as an art director at cig specifically <sighs> I mean, I, what is the most enjoyable thing? I mean, I take a lot, unfortunately, I take a lot of stuff in my stride. I guess I take it for granted. <laughs> I have been trying to do better with that. So I think it's the, you know, it's realizing what I do for a job. I mean, it's, it's a bit ridiculous, right? It's, I mean, I only have to walk down the stairs and come here for one, but then I, I don't really have anybody telling me what to do. Obviously, mm. I've got a schedule that I work to, and, and um, I sort of am very good at self-managing stuff. Um, and then it's you know it's it's pretty much what what cool thing am I going to work on today? It's you know and um, you know like today it was FPS weapons. Yesterday it was uh, getting ready for promo for a, another new ship, which I can't talk about um and so it's and it's also just working with uh, the team right so basically you know i work with quite a lot of contractors and i also try and i almost treat them as you know internal staff members and so it, it's not just oh, i'll get that done i don't give a monkeys you know just you know I try and be accommodating we have a chat you know then we'll chat about ships you know, and it, there's a lot of back and forth, and um, yeah, it's it's just that really. It's just cool. you know, it's it is a kind of, like I said, it's a bit of a ridiculous job. When when I tell people, <laughs> I remember how stupid it is because they give me this funny look where they're like, "What do you mean you make spaceships?" Oh yeah, all it takes <laughs> is telling someone who doesn't work in your field, yeah. and instantly they're <laughs> like, "Wow, that sounds amazing as a job." Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. and they're just like, "Oh." That's that sounds amazing. Yeah. And I'm like, 
So it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Then you feel bad about complaining about any job, you know, just kind of the run of the mill job things you may complain. Yeah. I, I do the same thing sometimes. Every um, day with me. Yeah. He'll describe his job and I'm like, wow. Yeah. Uh, Starlet, you want to grab the next one? Sure. Um, what's your favorite phase of concept development at CIG? My favorite phase. Ooh. Well, it sort of flip flops. And it depends on how well the ship's going. Um, oft, sometimes it's the very start phase where, you know, you've, you know, especially when you're working with a, like a, a brand new ship, you know, there's a, it's either a, you know, it's got a new special, whatever it is, um, special ability or career, and you've never done one before. Um, and so the kind of the world is your oyster. To a certain degree and we'll always try and push as much as we can but we kind of know what chris likes so sometimes we'll we'll just push anyway and just see what happens you know he might take something from it and, and fold it back in um but i think like if i was you know i had to put my silver dollar down it would be the promo phase it would be you know once you've got that final ship and then doing, you know, sort of selling the dream, essentially doing the, doing those promo shots and showing it in, in action or doing the, you know, showing it in with its special ability or whatever it is. Um, those are really a joy. I mean, basically any day in key shot is a good day for me. That's just something about it just gives me good, good vibes. Cool. Um, okay. So. Cool. All right. So, uh, when a, when a new ship, uh, is being, concepted um how does the process get started uh how are artists selected and and uh are they selected for a certain style or or how does how do you bring a team together to start working on a new ship yeah so generally it's it's normally one artist per ship so and we and we have done it where there's been two or three maybe when the chips have been down and we've got to get it finished but it gets quite difficult then but um yeah, obviously you get the brief. Well, not obviously. You get the brief from the designers, giving you all the details, dimensions, weaponry, function, um, landing pad size, manufacturer. Um, and then once I know that, and uh, and so really it's down to the manufacturer and the size. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of and the time frame as well. Who's who can do the job that I need, basically. Because not all concept artists are the same, right? Yeah. Same title, but everyone's different. And so sometimes, you you know, that's the difficult part when you work with somebody new, you're not sure what their strengths and weaknesses are going to be. And that can get a bit, not tense, but, uh, you know, when time is passing and you're not, and it, the target's not being hit, then it's like, okay, how do we, how do we hit this target? And Paul, is there, are there some artists that think more, or are there some artists that like maybe are great on ship exteriors, but then don't really know how to parse the interiors or, or do you, or is that, is that sort of what you're talking about? It's more, um, it's more stylistic. So, um, uh, you know, it's, some people will struggle with the sort of long flowing surfaces, say of like, you know, the origin series, mm -hmm. that's just not, you know, is not their bag. Right. You know, they just want, they just want like big and blocky and industrial. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Drake. I mean, I like, I, I didn't used to like Drake. Don't think at the start, but I really, I, I, th I think, I think I like them all now. They've all got, yeah. like, I think there was a point where there wasn't quite enough personality to the different yeah. manufacturers, and now it's properly, well, probably the cement. There's some areas of crossover, but sure. there's definitely a, you know, manufacturer feel. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, if someone can, I mean, the exterior is generally the hardest, I would say, in terms of, you know, because the interior, we generally have a lot more kits to work with. Right. The exterior has generally got to be pretty unique. I mean, yeah, everybody knows we we do some kit bashing on some of them, but that that kind of makes sense as well, doesn't it? For a manufacturer, you, you want to have that um, shared DNA yeah. running through. 
Um, and so I think it's more it's more down to sort of how their sort of working methodology, how they work with the 3D software, how they deliver, basically, you know, how, some people's expectations of what a delivery is is quite loose, and um, whereas some people properly fully understand, okay, it's this, 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 this is what Paul wants to see. And and that is often through, just only through experience of working with me and working on the project. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, um, it's that. And yeah, if it's a, if it's, if it's a big ship, they're really quite complex beasts, yeah. um, not for the faint hearted. And if it's an alien one, then, then you go into a special category of, <laughs> of difficulty. Yeah. Um, and, and Paul, real quick here, to, to be um, considerate of your time, we have about six more questions. Do you have time for those, or yeah, should we try go to for it. Okay, no, cool. No, fine, yeah. Starlet, do you want to launch into the next one? Sure. Um, okay, so throughout the years, um, we've had lots of wonderful ship reveals. Um, the concept art uh, varies quite a bit in how much detail is shown of a, at, at that concept level. Um, what goes into deciding what kind of concept imagery is needed for a particular ship. Yeah, I know. And to add on to that real quick, I, you know, I, I was recently looking at like the Nautilus's um, brochure and I was looking at all the crazy cutaways and stuff. And, and, and yeah, I was curious about the same thing, you know, what constitutes what type of level of detail you go in, in, a, in the concepting phase. Yeah. Um, so it used so so in answer to your first question, it used to be a little bit loosey goosey. Like it would generally be me deciding what images we would do, and again, it's it's a formula, it's a landed shot, it's a flight shot. It's a you know you've got to make sure it's showing the front, the back, the top, the underside, any special abilities, and then if we've got time, some interiors if we feel they're sort of unique to the ship, mm-hmm. and we still sort of follow that formula. But in recent, probably in the last. 12 months, there's been more of an alignment with marketing and I guess myself, um, cause it's, you know, it's basically time based. They have to be ahead of the ahead of us in decision-making so that when we get to the promo section, their decisions have been made about, okay, we're, we're, this is, this is what we're trying to highlight. This is the vibe. This is the theme. Yeah. And so it's generally that now that sort of dictates uh, what is going to be shown, but the shots are also sort of split into three categories of uh, complexity. You can tell the lack of my formula, right? I mm-hmm. should write another book on right. the art <laughs> formula or something. <laughs> it's just easier with this stuff. So we have like an A shot, B shot, C shot. So C shot is super easy. It's just like a ship flying, background blurred, boom, easy peasy. Uh, B shot is something a little more complex going on generally with characters that we've already got that we can pose just Mm -hmm. place in the scene Um, maybe a new background something like that some action that might be a b shot an a shot will be where we need proper custom characters custom clothing custom uh, facial expressions you know it just everything slows down at the moment for that and we're kind of working on that um, to try and improve that pipeline and so you've got that and then um, cutaways that is generally dictated by um, uh, the size of the event right so if it's IAE or um, right oh, people are going to laugh what's the hell what's the one at the end of the year um, the big show uh, I've got great. Well, what do we have? We have several now a year, right? We have Invictus, IAE, Citizen Con. Invictus. Yeah. yeah. I guess IAE and Citizen Con. Kind of in the same, yeah. Kind of yeah. together. And so generally those are biggest, often they've been bigger ships. Um, and so we'll do a cutaway for those. And yeah. so you just got to make sure that that information is early in the hopper. So when I say that, I mean that the concept artist knows that so that they take account for it when they're building the ship. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a whole bunch of work. And then, and the other thing that's never accounted for, well, we account for it, but is all of the concept ships then have to go through a reduction phase so that they are um, hollow viewer ready. Right, so right. 
So they have to be you know, like a specific mm-hmm. vertex amount. Yeah, this this isn't on our question list. Just kind of add it into this. Would you say that there's? I guess there's probably some special. Um, cases that sort of fall outside the norm. The one I, I tend to think of would be something like the Kraken where its reveal contained a full trailer, you know, in addition to just concept mm-hmm. imagery or even like concept imagery imagery that's been given like, you know, moving backgrounds or animations to kind of give it some life. You know, the Kraken felt like it was almost coming from a whole different cloth. Maybe it was because of the size of the ship and the event, but it seemed like there was probably a lot more concept work that had to get in place for that reveal, um, yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of concept on that, and when we got, to, I mean, you had two things, right? You had you had quite a large dump of images, yeah, and then you had, and then you had the trailer. So, um, so I think there were three of us. It was me, Gavrothry. Gavrothry was the concept artist, aren't? And then Sarah, Sarah McCulloch, who's mm-hmm. no longer with us, she's moved on. And so we basically, what I normally try and do is give the, the primary concept artist sort of first dibs, like say, okay, which images do you want to do? Like, you know, so they get to pick the hero shots, <laughs> you know, and I think that's only fair, right? They've done yep. all this, you know, they've been on this thing for months. Yep. Um, and so you want to give them uh, a bit of a bit of a reward for doing yeah. this work, and then I'll just pick up whatever's you know whatever's needed. Um, and like and Gavin, then, for instance, I believe Gavin has a really strong three um, D skill set as well, right? Yes, From what I've seen yeah, of him, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. and that probably yeah. helps translate to something like, for example, getting a ship ready for a trailer. You know, when it's still in that um, concept phase. Yes and no. I mean, yeah, you've got essentially you've got a template to work with, but you know, when the ship is maybe like, I mean, that ship was probably like thirty million polys. Yeah, and so you need to bring it down to probably like, <laughs> I don't know, five hundred thousand or something. Yeah. Uh, what the poor ship team basically take that model, and I mean, it depends on how much time they've got, right? So sometimes, and I think you, I think you notice it on the trailer. Some parts of the ship are rebuilt, so they're almost like game ready, mm-hmm. and then some part is just like decimated concept mesh. So right. there's a real. You can see, you can notice the notice the disparity if you sort of look closely. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, it, that was. That was quite tricky. Kind of a special case, yeah. Um, th- yeah. This kind of goes along with that. So when a ship has already been concepted and revealed, um, let's say it was, you know, back in 2016 or something, and then that ship sort of go, you know, we notice this sometimes with the roadmap. It, it'll sort of go back into reconcepting. And, you know, we've heard um, one example I think of, and not that it's specific to this ship, but, you know, recently I've been thinking about the Polaris in this regard, where it had its concept passed or an early concept passed and reveal, went to sell to backers and stuff. And then, you know, it's it goes through a reconcept. For those ships that have to to do that, especially major reconceptings, what what are sort of the overarching goals and and um, you know whatnot that's that are trying to be a re- you know accomplished in that reconcepting phase? So most of the reconcepts take place because uh, those ships were um, done pre pre pipeline, right? So mm-hmm. we didn't have a formal design document. We didn't have. Um, metrics, formal metrics, you know, like how tall is a desk, how big is a docking collar, how much um, how much distance between the floor and the bottom of the ship do we need to account for landing gear compression, that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, so like in terms of, the, let's say, the Polaris, uh, we... Again, it was pre. It, that was sort of pre-concept pipeline as well. So it was pre-design pipeline, pre-concept mm-hmm. pipeline. So we we had a cool ship built. It was kind of our side looking. We did some rooms, and the but the rooms were built um, in isolation. Right. Don't for for that. imagery, yeah. essentially, right? Yeah. 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 So here's a cockpit. Here's a corridor. Right. Here's a here's a hangar. Um, and I. And I guess it was, you know, time, experience, all sorts of reasons why, you know, whatever decisions were made back then. Um, we know a lot more now. And so yeah. when it, so basically it will go, you know, for the ship to get built, you know, we, 
on the sort of art production side, you know, you've got a full range of artists ranging from junior to mid, senior, principal, lead. So that's a big ship, right? So if seniors and principals have normally got plenty of information and experience to fill in the blanks, you know, it's harder for juniors and mid-level artists because they're just like, oh, what do I do with this? And mm-hmm. They might fill it with stuff and it's just completely wrong for the manufacturing stuff. <laughs> or the corridor goes off in the wrong direction or something. Uh, you know, I'm just making this yeah. stuff up now. Yeah, for sure. So we basically take all the metrics, take any revisions that John Crew has sort of worked into there since the original document, um, and then just do a full pass yeah. exterior and interior. And so, I mean, the, I don't, did we, I don't think we've released any of the Polaris no, not interior. Yet. So no, yeah, no. that had, that's, yeah, we did a full rework on that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's good. It's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. So. And I'm, and I'm guessing sh- based off how, you know, back in the day that ship was originally concepted probably warrants more and more changes. I'm sure we could see, you know, the same sort of reconcepting phase go along with some of those older concepts like the crucible and stuff. That's just naturally they're going to have to have yeah, that stuff all gonna, put yeah, in there. So. All have to go through, um, right? But you mentioned metrics. Uh, Ender, you want to grab that next question? Because I think this ties directly into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you've mentioned metrics uh, a few times to metric. Uh, and we hear that a lot uh, when it comes to, uh, learning about CIG designing ships. Uh, and we've seen a lot of discussion in different communities uh, with misunderstandings or their own interpretations on what that actually means. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you explain a bit uh, of the differences between how ships are designed in the earlier days versus how they're designed now? Uh, yeah, and- yeah, totally. I mean, it's, you know, in the early days, it's basically, you know, you're working with, obviously you're working with, talented senior concept artists and, you know, but they're asked, being asked to be built, you know, to build a spaceship, you know, it's kind of, it's this kind of style, industrial style, needs these rooms, it's got to have a docking collar, but it needs some weapons um, and that, and that's it and off they go. So, you know, they'll build a docking collar, but, you know, the docking collar might be, you know, it, it it might be rectangular and it needs to be circular. It might be four meters instead of two meters. It might be, um, I mean, there's all sorts of things because basically everybody, you say something to somebody and you can say the same thing to five different people and they'll all give you different, <laughs> yeah. uh, different solutions. Right. So, you know, same for the, you know, the guns and how they work and, um, yeah, so it's basically a st- basically metrics is just coming up with a standardization. So everyone then there's no excuse for something not working. Mm-hmm. So and you know we've even got you know we've got we've got uh, sizes for components, weapons, desks, chairs, how much space between objects so that the AI nav mesh can yeah. uh, figure it out. And um, I imagine that has to even sometimes so evolve. Cameras can duck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if I was, you know, if I was critical, I think we were a little bit late coming in with our metrics. Um, I probably would have preferred to see them a little earlier on. Mm-hmm. But you know that you know that was years ago, um, yeah. and so here we are. So it you know it just makes it a lot easier because now I have a I have a kit like a three D kit that's all laid out. And we have you know we have another whiteboard that basically defines how things work, the relationship to others, what to watch out for, mm-hmm. don't do this. Um, all that sort of stuff. So we're, you know, new and old uh, concept artists, because often there's a lot of information, right? Um, and I've stopped trying to remember it all. You know, I kind of <laughs> rely more on designers. Yeah, and designers are more involved now. That's also the recent change. And it sounds ridiculous because they should have been involved anyway. Um, but it just makes the process a lot smoother. And actually, you know, we've had, you know, been working with one designer on the Banu uh, Merchantman. And um, yeah, he's had some great art ideas, you know, that we've, you know, because he's, again, he's sort of seeing it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. 
Sure. And so he's just like, oh, what about this? And we're like, oh, yeah, I hadn't, you know, hadn't thought of that. Okay, yep, <laughs> sure, let's, let's do that. And yeah. so, you know, I like I said earlier on, you know, I don't mind if, if, if there's a good idea and, it's, and it hasn't come from me. Yeah, you know, good ideas can come from interns. Yeah, you know, what yeah. I mean, they can they can really sprout up from anywhere. Yeah, that's, so. I mean, that's kind of what uh, team leader should be. Really, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's not that you have to have all the answers, right? So this piques my interest just a little bit. You, you, you know, you've described to us what the metrics are um, that you guys have. Are there also, you know, manufacturer? specific metrics, you know, maybe uh, Crusader has these style of hotways while RSI has these. Do you guys have those? I'm not asking for. Um, so they're not, they're not metrics. Those are more just style guides, right? Okay. So it's more like, um, you know, it comes down to sort of, uh, you, you know, finance, you, kind of, you know, when you sort of look at these things, you sort of, uh, considering cost, you know, mm -hmm. there's the there's a real world cost of how much is this going to cost player, and therefore that sort of blends into the complexity of the ship. You know, if the ship's a cheap starter ship, it can't do all sorts of major magical things. Yeah, it's you know you'd have to pay more for that, right? Instead mm -hmm, of right. forty five dollars, it should be an eighty dollar ship. Yeah, and so as you go up that price bracket, the sort of the complexity also increases and the, not necessarily the coolness because what one person thinks is cool, another person won't think is cool. But yeah, um, yeah it's just, yeah, it will be like, oh yeah, a Crusader, nah, it doesn't, you know, it won't have this, yeah. you know, don't, don't do that. Everything yeah. needs to be hidden. The floors need to blend. Yeah. I know in my um, field, whenever I, start work with a new client, which I sort of sometimes, I guess you could think of as like a ship manufacturer, you do get like a, you get a, usually a PDF sent to you and it's a big brand guidelines book. You know what I mean? From everything from color palettes to the way logos should appear to the way, you know what I mean? All that stuff. So. Yes. And I wish, you know, that's the one thing my producers constantly bugging me for is yeah. those um, branding and style guides. Yeah. And the, at the moment, the sort of the half, the sort of, <laughs> it's kind of, in the team's DNA, it's sort of held there, and some bits are on the whiteboard. Yeah, and then, um, but ideally, it should have been a big formal document. Yeah. I'm telling you, CIG should release. I tell you what would be a good CIG merch idea. They need to release a book of concept art, hardback book of concept art. That would be an easy purchase for me. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I mean, we've got more concept than. Yeah, I've, I've ever seen. Yeah, I know ever. Blizzard had an entire like they have an entire like art gallery at their headquarters that you can walk through. That's that's pretty wild. Um, some of my friends were telling me about, but yeah, no, I'd love a, a big book of, of of that type of stuff. Uh, real quick, um, Paul, with with large ships, it's kind of going into what you're just talking about, but with large ships that have you know, more than one future role possibly tied to them. And I'm thinking, you know, large complex ships like a Kraken or a Merchant Man or even something that has a lot of moving parts to it, like we've seen with the early concept of, of the Pioneer. How does the ship's role or gameplay possibilities, which which may not be fully understood at the at the state, you know, concepting stage, how does that factor in to a concept art, artist's job and and how do they plan ahead for possibilities that may not be known at those early stages? You know what I mean? Yeah. Whether that's, uh, you know, maybe how a gameplay loop is going to evolve or or how, you know, you know something like a, a cartography room in a ship. Maybe, you know, if, if, if some of that's still being sussed out um, internally, yeah. how, do, how do concept artists deal with that and how do you direct them to deal with that? I mean, the cartography room is... Uh, always been a difficult one, yeah. Because it's like, what do we, what do we put in here? Mm -hmm. like a big hollow map. Like <laughs> we're always a bit sort of, yeah. Um, like I need more information, John. Like we can make yeah. it cool, kind of. Yeah. But that is that is probably the trickiest one. That not trickiest one, the most unresolved one, I would say, in a way. But when it comes to, um. I mean, yeah, we, we went through a phase where we were tackling some really complex stuff that was we didn't know actually how the game loop was, game loop was going to work, right? Mm -hmm. um, now it's sort of that stuff generally is getting pushed off 
further in terms of, you know, we wait until we have more information now. So until, you know, Ben does a bit of prototyping um, and then John's like, right, this is what it needs to do. This is what you guys need to factor in. But there's still always a certain amount of best guess, right? Yeah. So, you know, we, and often, you know, often we've fallen foul where we'll follow the design brief to the letter because, you know, John's like, he's do A, B, and C. I'm like, okay. And then Chris will see it and go, what's this? This is boring. Right. What, what? And we're like, well, this is what John asked for. And he's like, yeah, but it's boring. I don't want you like, just make something cool. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, generally we we try and circumvent that now and just come up with the cool thing. And, and yeah. Like, okay. And sometimes we'll push outside of the brief. We'll be like, you know, John didn't ask for it. We're like, what about yeah. this, John? Is this cool? I mean, yeah. take the um, the quad bike, right? The, mm-hmm. the hover quad. That wasn't even asked for. That I I came up with that in an afternoon, <laughs> and uh, I was like, "What about this, John?" <laughs> and uh, and it got traction, and then it went through the process, which yeah. is quite nice. Cool. Um, but um, yeah, it's yeah. You basically you give it your best guess. You you know it's. You, you sort of sell the dream, not the dream, but it has to work. Yeah. Like, like as, make it as viable as you can, you know, re- refueling or whatever. Um, because a, then, a little bit of a change occurred, I guess, with the Pioneer, right? In terms of, you know, we heard at the last, what was it? Was, I think it was a citizen con. They talked a little bit about maybe how the pioneer's role would change. So, you know, I'm sure that, you know, eventually when the pioneer does some sort of reconcepting pass, you know, that will, those updates will then have to be considered. You know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And the, the funny thing, this is a funny tidbit. Um, it's like the pioneer I didn't actually work on, mm-hmm. even though I gave the presentation for it, like, like a week before I found out I was giving the presentation. <laughs> You spoke very highly of it. I, I was fully convinced. And, uh, <laughs> Me too. And, uh, and there was like graphics for like with not like sort of half existing. So I kind of like pulled it all together, yep. and then and did you know did my best sales job, um, which actually I'm really quite proud of. But that's a separate thing. Um, <laughs> and so what happens is that we do our best guess, um, and we've got other ships which are sort of on the back burner because of. The really sort of end game kind of ships, yeah. And um, and then what will happen is that ahead of time, of, ahead of it going into production, um, we'll just assign another concept pass to those mm-hmm. to those grey areas, you know, areas where we're like it's not quite working. Yeah. And often it's quite good for um, juniors or mid level guys because. Um, probably more juniors for concept um, because it gives them a chance to work on a part of a ship. You know, they're not mm-hmm. overwhelmed. It's like, okay, just work on, I just want, you know, just give me a cool refueling arm or give me a cool welding arm that goes on top of the Argo, Right. that sort of stuff. And they're like, okay, yeah, I can, I can do this. Yeah. Cause it is a bit overwhelming when you first come into star citizen because it's, Oh, massive. I can imagine. It's so yeah. massive. All the interconnected systems and pipelines and, and, and uh, you know, yeah. format, yeah. even just crazy things like file formats and organization. And, you know, people think, forget a lot about that. You know, I deal with that at my small studio all the time, you know, just working with outside contractors, keeping your file names consistent and this consistent and that, you know what I mean? It, it can get really complicated quickly. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, Starlet, you deal with the same thing just in, in, in programming and stuff. But, uh, Paul, we have... Two more questions for you. Um, for one's it. probably a harder one. One's probably an easy one. So, Starlet, you want to hit that harder one? Sure. Um, okay, so CIG has uh, a quarterly patch release cycle, um, and these are usually aligned with uh, with sales and concept releases and things. Um, how, how does the uh, quarterly release cycle affect your team, and how does it affect you as, as the art director? Um. It's it, in a way it doesn't really affect me. Like mm-hmm. I'm almost, um, I mean it doesn't. It doesn't like because we're, we're kind of we almost run parallel. So you have the you have the quarterly release of the game, you know, and everybody is you know pumping content in and, and getting that ready. And then obviously you know we've got a sale that's coming up in parallel. 
Um, and so, you know, it's just basically, I mean, we're always well ahead generally, like, you mm-hmm. know, I, I know what I'm doing for the next year kind of thing, okay. we're, you know, we're, we're like, again, we, we, you know, we have, we time box everything. So, you know, when John's like, oh, it's a small ship, like, okay, it's this amount of weeks. Oh, it's a mid-sized ship. It's this. It's a big ship. Oh, it's this. Right. And so we just go, we could just block it in super easy, sign concept artists. It, it almost is that simple hmm. um, once you know what you're doing. And then we just have to make sure that we're aligned with uh, the marketing and that uh, they know what we're working on. They're aware of what the ship is. They obviously then come back with how they want to, um, how they want to sort of promote the ship. Yeah. Um, and then it's just we have to come in quite a bit ahead of time. Generally, um, you know, we're we're normally done months, months, and months and months ahead um, because it's there's still all the other processes it's got to go through, right? So it's got to go to Turbulent and they've got to set up the website and they've got to go through their pipeline first, yeah. pass, second pass, polish, make sure everything's working and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we're kind of a little, like we're in this, we're in this nice little cozy side track, basically, mm-hmm. we're like this little sort of um, SWAT team, just doing our cool stuff. Yeah. We're just like, hey, <laughs> are you guys, are you Not guys sweating about you, the release? <laughs> Um, so yeah so we have you know we have deadlines well I mean I can't like have a deadline every month essentially but you know we're we're sort of running in a slightly different um, track to the quarterlies yeah Um, well that's great thanks Paul for going through all this because we have one final question for you and this obviously is the easiest question because there really is only one answer I'm pretty sure you had a hand in its design. Um, how excited are you for the Drake Corsair? I am. Uh, Can't even put it into words. You heard it here, folks. He cannot put it into words. How excited he is I'm, for Grimm's favorite ship. I I actually, I mean, I really like that ship. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff I like about it. And as I mentioned earlier, I get a bit blasé about stuff. So I see it every week. Yeah. And you've lived with it for a while, so. I've lived with it for a while. Yeah. You know, we've, uh, but, you know, obviously it goes to the ship team and they're sort of working out, you know, because there are some areas that we didn't really work out. And yeah. we did do a little second pass on how that second chair goes down and stuff, yeah. um, which was a bit of a worry for me initially. Um, and I think I've just got to the point where I'm like, oh, it's, it, it's coming out. Of course yeah. it's coming out. Like, Is it? Is it interesting seeing, you know, after the ship team, um, you know, has had their hand in it and it's nearing, you know, the finish line there to go flight ready at some point. Is it interesting to kind of look at where it's, it's come based off your initial concepts? Is that something that's always kind of fun to do? Yeah, no, it's always good to see, you know, what, A, what they've had to fix, B, um, you know, what decisions they've made in terms of, uh, you know, often, you know, because often there's a lot of room for manoeuvre in terms of spicing it up, in terms yeah. of, you know, because, you know, we work with a kit just out of time, just to cut down on time. So we might just block stuff in, generic Drake yeah. stuff, you know, boxes and wires and um, verticals. And, um, but really, you know, you'd want to spend another two weeks like properly working out the cockpit. So it's sure. just amazing. And so that it's generally, you know, it's those sort of rooms, you know, and there's also that room where it's like sort of hexagonal, like mm. it's octagonal, I think it is, um, where all the components are stored. And so just seeing how they've sort of really worked up those areas. Yeah. Um, and I think, cool. you know, I think once we get to see it sort of land, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, you, you, you just, you're just like, yeah, it's another ship. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, it's another check I mean, mark they, on the resume. They, well, <laughs> yeah. not so much that. They just do an amazing job. Yeah. And you, and you, and you get used to it. And, you know, sometimes yeah. you just have to be like, this is, this is kind of not normal. Like what they, what they achieve, you know, the level of sort of fidelity and quality yeah. and care um, 
is you know is really quite impressive yeah you know, even for a grizzled veteran like yeah. me i'm just like oh, i think okay. I, I remember something john cruz said um in a past video i think it was a video from last year and he said it and, and i always thought of it like this but i just never heard it said and it kind of light bulb you know he, he said something to the like how the ships are essentially these massive flying structures, you know, with all these rooms and walkways and control yeah, flying, centers. Levels. And when you think of it, it's like a whole gameplay level within, mm-hmm. you know, a hull that you're able to move and control. When you think of it like that, the complexity kind of come, you know, becomes clear. So, yeah, yeah. and especially for the, you know, the big stuff and, yep. you know, because you, there's, you know, there's, there's, because, you know, you could go ultra realistic route and you, that would just, that would alter the layout, you know, it would be quite boring. So sometimes we will make decisions where it's just to improve gameplay, Yeah, you know, because it is a flying multiplayer levels and you don't want, you, you know, you want to avoid, like if you've got choke points, you, you want to be able to like create opportunities for people to get around that choke point. You don't want it to be like a, yeah. you know, like a, uh, you know, a certain death match where people just, <laughs> line up and just hold the finger yeah. on the trigger and and yeah. hope so um yeah Very it's cool. uh it's interesting well paul we've taken a lot of your time today we really appreciate you hanging out with us chatting star citizen chatting um you know uh being a creative in the industry um and and absolutely chatting about your book game artists uh, again all of our um you know our community is really excited about this book but if you haven't bought it go buy it what are you doing go buy it um, we'll also give away one of these at the end of the show tonight um but paul again once again thank you for hanging out with us this was a real pleasure um you know for me personally yeah, I've told this story multiple times on on Star Jump Station and in my streams and stuff like that. The whole reason I started doing like fan cinematics was because I saw one piece of Kraken concept art that I was like, "Oh man, that is yep. that needs to be on the back of my wall. I need to make turn that into like a moving animation." And that just then turned into my own fan cinematic. So it was all kind of gestated from concept art. And I and I constantly, I think in my my Drake one or Aegis one, I actually put a thank you to CIG concept artists in there because um you know in a sense we're all buying into this because of the dream you know chris roberts dream and and what we're seeing and i think there's a lot of excitement when we see those possibilities and the the concept art that you all create and work on um you know is is our visual window into that i think we hear the words from chris and that's great and the concept art and not just for ship stuff but ships weapons locations you know when you see those early concept art pieces of like art corp and things like that you know those visuals stick in the mind you know in our minds and burn in our minds and again help reinforce that dream and you know we're kind of all on this journey together to see star citizen become a reality and um so just a big thank you to you and your team uh please give our thanks to everyone um on your team back at cig uh really enjoyed you sitting and chatting with us thank you very much it's been a pleasure um anytime awesome uh, yeah, Great. we can chat more stuff no problem absolutely well thanks thanks paul appreciate it Thank you.